So next week we're starting at the movies, but this week we get to hear from our senior associate pastor, Melanie Falco. So join me in giving her a hand as we welcome her up. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it is, oh, did I leave my sermon down there? I did not <laughs> get myself organized. Um, it is so good to be back. It's really good to be back. Um, I just want to take a second and thank you so much for the blessing that you gave us to be able to go on sabbatical, to be able to be gone for three months, to sow into our kids, and to be able to kind of like refresh. Um, we were able to redo our garden, which is really my, my gift from sabbatical. <laughs> Um, we had a garden that Greg made for me a few years ago, and of course we made it out of non-pressure treated wood so that it wouldn't leach into the soil, but it was a raised bed garden. So after five years, you can just go like that to it and the bed falls over. So um, my brother-in-law came with his auger and we put some posts in and now we have like a different kind of bed and I'm excited. I brought Ayla in just yesterday. We went in the garden and probably a good I don't know, two-thirds of the plants are taller than her. So it's good. They're not weeds. They're not weeds. My tomatoes and my zinnias are tall. So yeah. Um, it is a new season. It's a new season. Uh, we're ending the summer, right? We're starting the fall. Kids are starting in new grades. Midsummer flowers are finishing up. And mums are starting to show up on everyone's porch. Uh, leaves are starting to change, whether we realize it or not. If you look around, you'll notice. Um, yeah, everyone's saying, shh, stop. But it's happening. My apple tree is super heavy with apples. I had to go pick some off so that it didn't break the, um, all the boughs didn't break. And so it's already almost ready to harvest in a few weeks. We're going to start with apples. A new season. It's a new season. And as I was praying this summer, knowing that I was going to speak here and just saying, Lord, what do you want to say? What do you want to say to us? And he said to me that this is a new season. When Greg and I come back from sabbatical, he wanted to start a new season here at church. So there's been lots of changes over the last few years if you've been here. Um, there's lots of new families becoming part of our bigger church family. People are growing in leadership and stretching themselves and leading groups. And there's been... Um, people coming, starting to function in the gifts that the Lord put on their lives, and we've really enjoyed the blessing and the favor of the Lord as a church this last couple of years. Um, but I hear the Lord saying to us, I want to take you deeper. And so first, um, I, the first thing that the Lord spoke to me is, he said, I want you to recognize, first of all, that you're coming into a new season. And so I don't know if you've ever played the board game Everdell. Um, I think there's a picture. See, that's Everdell. Isn't it super cute? It's really cute. That's the chip sweep. I think he's the cutest character. Um, but our family learned how to play this a few years ago, and we were recently given it as a gift. And so we can play it whenever we want. And the point of the game is that you have all these little critters, and you build them into a city, and each of the critters can do different things. So like the chip sweep there, he lets you activate a power in someone else's city. Anyways, so... Um, you're building, you're going through season after season, and you're building this little village of critters. That's the game. And four times or three times during the year, you have to stop and prepare for the season. You have to stop and prepare for the next season that you're going to move into with your critters. And during that time, you get to collect all the things that your little critters get so that you can pay for things in the next season. So that sounds complicated, but really it is just preparing for the season. It's, it's recognizing the season's coming and you stop and prepare for it. And that's what I feel like the Lord is saying to us. Recognize that I'm going to bring you into a new season, and so it's time to start to prepare. Um, I know that there are people that dread season changes. You are the people who sit in the same seat every Sunday. You're the people who, you know, want to wear your summer clothes as long as possible. You don't want, you don't want to admit that it's, it's going to get colder or it's going to, and then you have the other people who are already full decked out for fall right now, right? It's going to be 90 degrees tomorrow and you want to wear plaid and drink pumpkin spice. You are, right? We have different kinds of people. They like the seasons they, and some of us don't. 
We have people that don't like spring because they don't like mud. But the benefit of spring is that it warms up, and then we have summer. We have to recognize, you cannot keep wearing your bathing suit all the way through the winter. You have to recognize the next season's coming, and you have to embrace it. And here, in our area, we have four really beautiful and distinct seasons. And some of you don't agree with me that they're all beautiful, but they are all distinct. And um, so we can't stay in our season year-round. We can't just say, oh, well, I'm just going to live in the fall all year. Because the season comes whether we want to or not, and our choice is whether or not we're going to prepare ourselves for it. Are we going to put away the bathing suit and get out the jeans and the sweater? Are we going to put away the cute summer sandals and start for the fall shoes and then the winter shoes and then the mud shoes and then the sandals again? We have to make the choice to change the season. And in the same way, uh, we as a church need to prepare for the next season that God is bringing us into. My garden two times. Um, I like house plants. I picked up a free one from the Buy Nothing site yesterday, String of Hearts. Um, I love plants, all different kinds of plants. But the beautiful thing about plants in the fall is that, and especially trees, it's a season where they dig their roots deep. It's where they, they make sure that those roots, they go, and it's an intensive period of time where their roots go deeper in to make sure that they're all settled and straight for the winter. And this is what I hear God saying to us. He said, I'm calling you from a season of passive growth to a season of intentionally pursuing the growth of your roots in Christ. That's what I feel like the Lord is saying. He's calling us from a season of passive growth. We've been growing. We've been enjoying the presence of God. We've been really living in the blessing of the Lord. But he's saying, I want you to go deeper. I'm calling you to a season of intentionality, of, of making your roots deep in Christ. Healthy roots feed the tree. God wants us to have healthy roots to feed the tree because he wants to produce good fruit in our lives. And... Um, so this season, as we go into the fall, I believe that the Lord is also calling us to a season of pursuit, a season of pursuit of him. So Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 says, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They're like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. So this new season that we're beginning, then, is that season for us to go deep with our roots, to pursue the Lord with intentionality. So I was thinking about the word pursue, and I don't know about you, but the first scripture that I think of when I think of the word pursue is Psalm 34, 14, which says, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So this, this scripture is specifically talking about peace, but I wanted to look at the difference between what seek means and and what pursue means. Because to me, when I look at them, I'm like, they're close to the same. You seek something, you pursue something, the same. But when I started to dive into it a little, I discovered that seeking is really passive. It's like to request, to desire, to, you know, kind of strive after, but it's a lot more passive. When you look at the definition of pursuit, it means to chase, to hunt, to harass, or to dog something. It's intentionally going after that thing. It's not just passively. So I had, I had this beloved babysitter when I was a kid. Her name was Amanda, and she was really sweet to us. We had, there was three little girls at the time in my family, and she was just really sweet. She had this dog named Joshua who was a cute little Samoid puppy. Some people say Samoid. Apparently the British way of saying it is Samoid, and the American way of saying it is Samoid. I looked that up. But... The, so she had this cute little puffball of a white dog. It was, like, so cute. So they had a sunken living room at their house, and the dog was not allowed in the living room. He could only go on to the step above it. And they hosted small groups and stuff like that. And the dog would stand on the, on the step and bark at you while you're sitting in the sunken living room. So that does not go well for hosting a small group or having people over. So what they would do while they were training the dog, because you have to train the dog, but it's not trained to behave. So they had this though they had this beautiful mudroom. They put the dog in the mudroom during that time. And 
one day he was very upset, apparently, about being in the mudroom. And we're not talking about being in there for all of you who are worried. He was not in there alone for, like, long, long periods of time. He was just in there, you know, so that he'd stop the barking there. He ate his way out. He ate through one layer of drywall, then pushed aside the, the um, what do you call it, insulation, and then ate through the next piece of drywall to come through. So he was very, I'm going to think that's dogged pursuit, I'll say. Dogged pursuit. He was, like, very determined to get to his people. And so he didn't let a wall stop him from that. But sometimes, like with us, we get in the routine of being a Christian. We grow little by little. We let ourselves, you know, like, oh, Lord, you're doing this in me. It's so good. Oh, I'm learning this. But God is calling us to that new season that we're willing to tear down whatever wall we need to get through to pursue the Lord, to be with the Lord. So 1 Timothy 6.11 is the key verse that the Lord was speaking to that I want to go through with you this morning. So 1 Timothy 6, verse 11, it says this. But you, man of God, I just want to stop there. It's Paul talking to Timothy. So Timothy is a man of God. That does not mean it does not apply to us, ladies. Because he could have been talking to someone else and said, but you, O woman of God. So we can do that ourselves and say, oh, you, person of God, flee from this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So Paul is talking to Timothy about being a man of God, about what it takes to be a man of God. And if you look at the previous verses, you'll see all these things that he told Timothy to avoid and to run away from. And then here he talks about the things he wants him to run towards. And I would challenge you to read that whole section with the Lord and just say, Lord, are there things in my life that Paul's warning Timothy about that I need to be running away from? Um, and then just deal with some of those things in your heart, in your own heart with the Lord, in your time with the Lord this week. But this, we're going to focus on the things that God called Timothy to run towards. Um, so the first thing that he said is pursue righteousness. And righteousness is our behavior conformed to the Lord's norms, to his norms. So if you don't know what a norm is, norm is a rule and expectation that governs our behavior. For example, our culture has social norms. Like, if I give you something as a gift, you say, thank you. That is a norm, right? That we're teaching our children those things. Here's another one. If you come upon a bathroom and you need to use it, but the door is closed, you knock. And then you say, you wait and you listen to see if someone says, I'm in here. And if you hear nothing, you double check. You knock again. Say, is anyone in here? And then you and if you hear nothing, then you turn the handle slowly and see. This norm, social behavior, social norm, keeps us from embarrassment. It keeps us from walking in on somebody. It keeps their embarrassment and our embarrassment, right? Social norm. So does our behavior in our lives line up with what Jesus is asking of us? We know that the Bible says there's not one of us who is fully righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. We receive the righteousness of God. When we give our hearts to the Lord, when we become Christians, we receive the righteousness of God. But there has to be more than that because Paul is saying to Timothy, pursue righteousness, which means there's more than just that. The Holy Spirit lives within us as Christians and continually makes us more like Jesus. But we can choose to pursue more of that. We can choose to pursue more of living our lives with the Lord. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So when we look at righteousness, we can say, are, are we really hungry for our lives to line up with the norms of God? Are we taking steps to get to know him and align our priorities? Some things that you could think about with this. Uh, number one, how we use our money. Is the way that we're using our money aligning with the norms of God? First thing, are you tithing? Are you tithing? Is it 10%? And you're like, oh, great. First week up, and she's going to talk about tithing. But this is a norm of the Lord. This is something very clear outlined in the Bible that says, if you're saying, oh, I don't think a tithe is 10%, well, the word tithe means tenth, so you can let that one go. The 10% 10, 10 of what the Lord gives to us 
we are supposed to give to our local church. This is how it works. And we are better off and more blessed living with the 90% and under God's norm than we are walking outside God's norm and not. So is how, is how you're using your money. Are you purchasing things that are using your money for the glory of God? How about this one? Your time. Are you spending time growing in Christ, serving him, or are you wasting a lot of time on your phone, the social media, or maybe you're a fantasy sports person? I say that because we've had, I don't know, three drafts at our family in the last, like, four weeks fantasy football, three fantasy football drafts, and at least one, I think there's a hockey, fantasy hockey starting, which I didn't even know there was fantasy hockey. Um, how about video games? How about those funny Instagram reels that you send to your friends? Right? How we use our time. Look, all of those things are okay. None of those things are like sinful things to do. It's, are we using too much of our time when we should be pursuing relationship with the Lord, where we should be serving him, where we should be loving him. Maybe maybe it's taking time to read the word before we check our phone. It's little things of pursuit, putting Jesus first. How we use our mouth. Are we being careful to speak things that are truthful, that are encouraging, that are wholesome? Or are we finding ourselves getting caught up in gossip or foolishness? Pursuing righteousness is choosing to reject fear, like fear of missing out, fear of being wrong, fear of what other people will think, and intentionally setting our lives according to his standards. This allows us, like I said, to live in the blessing of the Lord. So righteousness, pursue righteousness. The next one that Paul talks to Timothy about is pursuing godliness. What does godliness even mean? I don't know, a lot of us probably only hear it in the term cleanliness is next to godliness. That doesn't explain it at all, and it literally is just the nice word of saying, your grandma saying, you really should clean your room. There's not, we don't have an explanation for godliness. We don't talk about it a lot. But godliness is awe and reverence of God that expresses itself in obedience. It's pursuing an awareness of God's authority and presence in our life and then expressing it through obedience to him. So I've got to tell you a fun story. Um, our lovely Crystal over here um, babysat our dog while we were in Virginia. And the, I think I have a picture of our dog. She's super cute. That's Kyla. She's a mini poodle. She's going to be 10 in November. And um, she's a sweet little dog. We love her a lot. And she did great. Crystal took amazing care of her. She walked her. She fed her. She took her to Penyan on a road trip. I think there's a picture of that, too. Yep, there she is. And Kyla had the time of her life with Crystal. Like, they, they, she did great. But I left Crystal a very confusing note. And the note said, please make sure that when you take her for a walk at EBIC campus that she is on a leash. So that's, like, EBIC has little signs. Please keep your dog leashed great. But I did not tell Crystal that she should be on a leash everywhere else when you're taking a walk as well. So Crystal, being following our, our note, walked Kyla two times a day, 30 minutes a day with no leash. And the dog walked through town with Crystal without the leash. Like, no problem. No problem. And which is, you know, we're very blessed that this is the dog that we have, that that's what she wants to do. But um, she even walked with Crystal in Pen Yen with no leash. It wasn't like she just knew the town. She knew she was supposed to be with Crystal. So it's sort of like I was thinking about godliness with that. Kyla knew that her safest place and the place she was supposed to be was near Crystal. She knew that Crystal was the boss, and she also knew that this is what she was supposed to do. Like, she's supposed to, without a leash, walk through town, and so now Crystal knows that we have a, a leash rule in Lima that you're supposed to walk your dog on a leash. And so it's good. It's good. But the, the 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given to us all things <coughs> that, per 
that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. The power of God has given us everything we need to recognize the authority of God in our life, to recognize the presence of God in our life, and to let it build obedience in us. Everything we need, he's given us to be able to do that. So the question is, are we becoming more aware of his presence? Are we pursuing his presence? Lord, I w- make me more aware of you and your authority in my life. Are we asking for that? Are we pursuing that? Is our awareness of the Lord causing obedience in our life? All right, the next one, faith. Pursue faith. Faith is the initial and continuing act of trusting ourselves to the Lord. It's every day deciding to rest and trust the steady, reliable nature of God. Faith is believing that God is who he says he is, can do what he says he'll do, and that he wants us to pursue him. A lot of people think faith is one of those things you either have or you don't. Like, Well, I have faith for that. Oh, I don't really have faith for that. Well, I'm not a Christian because I don't have faith. Listen, faith is a gift from the Lord. It is also something that we can pursue. If not, Paul would not have said to Timothy, pursue faith. So we can pursue faith in our lives. We can pursue and grow in faith, in resting and trusting who God is. Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13 says this, Then you will call to me and go pray to me. I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. He'll be found by us. He wants us to pursue him. He's made himself available to us. He's reliable and rewards our seeking him. So are we pursuing that trust and faith in the Lord? Are we intentionally building our faith? Are we doing things that cause us to know who God is, to believe who God is, to believe who he's made us to be, and then making the choices to stick with that? Are we doing that in our lives? We can do this by memorizing memorizing scripture. Right? Then we know who God is. We start to believe it. We can do this by worshiping, and speaking, and singing about who God is and what he's done. We can build ourselves up. The Bible says we can build ourselves up on our most holy faith. We can build it up, singing to the Lord, praying, reading our Bible. These are not things that are like, well, now you have to do a 57-step thing. I'm talking about reading your Bible and praying and building yourself up in faith. And God is calling us to that, to a season of pursuing faith, pursuing believing him. The next one is pursuit of love. Love is a very flimsy word right now. There's lots of different opinions of how everyone's supposed to do love right now. But right here, Paul is talking to Timothy about affection towards himself and affection towards other people. He's talking about allowing God soften his heart so he can love God more deeply and love people. Love is fruit or evidence that the Holy Spirit is living in our lives. If you look in Galatians 5.22, love is one of the first fruit of the Spirit listed. It is evidence that he's in our life. So what does pursuing love look like? It's us pursuing the love of God, understanding the love of God, and then expressing that to other people. So how could we do that? How about pursuing forgiveness? We all take up offense through life. People do stuff and say stuff to us. But we can pursue forgiveness. We can pursue healing. We can pursue giving the Lord our heart and letting him deal with our hurt and our pain. It means for us getting rid of judgment, getting rid of bitterness, not allowing it to grow. But instead, you see, these things keep not only keep us from loving one another, they keep us from receiving the love of God in our lives. When we're so bitter, we don't we don't receive the love of God. God's saying, just let me love you and I can take away your bitterness. Love looks like doing what we need to do to grow in our love for the Lord. For me, 
I can pursue love for the Lord by intentionally reading the word, intentionally taking walks where I just blast the worship music. If you ever see me walking through town and I'm like, ah, it's because I have headphones in and I'm worshiping Jesus. Because it's intentionally pursuing the love of God, saturating myself with the knowledge of who he is and how much he loves me. Because when I know I'm loved, I love freely. And that's the same for you. When you know you are loved by the Lord, you're receiving the love of the Lord, you kn- it's so much easier for you to love somebody. Sort of like, I think of like Buddy the Elf. He says, the best way, come on, the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. It's purposefully entering into worship. My body, my mind, my voice, I'm engaging with the Lord. Lord, I love you. I am pursuing love for you, and I'm receiving your love back, and then I'm giving it out. So I would challenge you this week, spend some time with the Lord, make a list, ask the Lord, Lord, is there, are there things in my life that are keeping me from receiving your love and giving your love? And then write them down and take some time over the next couple months. Lord, this is what you showed me. I'm going to give it to you. I'm giving you this thing, and I'm asking you to heal me. I'm asking you to help me to forgive. I'm asking you. I'm, I am choosing to let go of this offense and to receive your love, to receive your forgiveness for holding the offense. All right, the next one. Pursue endurance. Endurance is one of the ways where character is me- measured, especially Christian character. But the idea of endurance, by saying that, Paul is saying, you're going to go through hard stuff. If we're pursuing endurance, it's to endure something. We are not guaranteed a golden ticket straight to heaven as soon as we get saved. We have life to live, and life is hard. And our culture likes to tell us that, especially our Christian culture, that if we're going through something hard, it's, there's something wrong. That, oh, Christians shouldn't go through any hard things. But this is not true. Jesus went through hard things. All of the disciples, all of the apostles went through hard things. If you'd like to read the Bible, you could really say it's a record of people going through hard things. Like, everybody went through something hard, and everyone is going to go through something hard. This is life. This is the way. I know it sounds terrible. Like, oh, she gets up there, and she's like, no, you're going to go through something hard. Listen, we are. This is part of life. And so we have to build endurance so that we stick with Jesus when it's hard. Because it's real easy for us to say, well, I thought God loved me, and then I went through this hard thing, and now I think, well, maybe he didn't. Well, that is not endurance. Not endurance at all. Endurance is sticking with the Lord when things get hard. But we are called to press into the strength of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit when we're going through something hard. When you're going to go out for a sport or you're going to go out for a marathon, you don't just show up. You train so that when you get there, you make the team. So that you don't die halfway through the marathon. It's the same with us. We have to know, hey, there's a possibility that something hard could happen. I need to do what I need to do now. I need to know, I need to do what I need to do now so that I can endure And it's not living with some, like, terrible foreboding. We're going to go through something bad. I'm so bad. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about building your life on a foundation of Jesus so that nothing shakes you. So after having Ayla, um, so Ayla's our 8-year-old. We have four kids, Gabe, Evan, Eden, Ayla. After we had Ayla, I went through a really pretty pretty serious season of um, postpartum anxiety and depression. And during that time, I really felt like every single day was overwhelming. Every day was overwhelming. And in the beginning, I thought, if only I could just uh, make the kids calm down so that I can go spend more time with Jesus. And then I thought, well, if I could just talk through my day with Greg. But I can't, it, that wasn't enough. I ended up needing to um, get some medical help and then also talking to a counselor as well as spending time with Jesus. But during that season, I had choices to make about endurance. 
I had to choose to receive the strength of the Lord when I didn't feel like it. And for me, that meant creating a moment with the Lord while I was doing laundry. I will give you a hint if you are a young parent. Folding laundry in the middle of a room with children is not going to work. You're going to fold it four or five times because as soon as you have a pile, someone will knock it over. So what you do is either, well, a couple tips. One, you fold it after they're in bed. Don't fold it. Just put it in people's drawers. We tried that for a season in our house, and it was bad. It was bad. Everything looked terrible. It was really wrinkly. Um, you could also um, fold it while your children are watching television because they just do this. And then you can fold off to the side and put it away quick. Um, but what I decided to do at that point was I would fold laundry while Ayla was napping. And originally I was like, you know what, I'm just going to watch a show while I'm folding. It'll be great. But then the Lord challenged me to pursue him during that time. And so instead, I put on a YouTube video of a worship set, of, of worshiping, other people worshiping. And then the Lord challenged me to join in. Fold your laundry and receive from the Lord. Fold your laundry and fix my eyes on Jesus. And um, that, for me, was like a, it sounds like, oh, that's such a small thing, but it really was like a lifeline for me to endurance with the Lord. Because much of what got me through that season was not current things I was learning from the Lord. It was leaning on the seasons of my life that I had sown in. And that's how endurance works. You lean on the foundation that God has built in your life. So you need to train yourself now to endure. Train yourself now. Sow into your season. Sow into the season that you're in. Jude 20 verse 21 says that we can keep ourselves in the love of God by building ourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and looking for the mercy of God. So pray. Pray builds endurance. Prayer builds endurance. It helps us know the Lord. It helps us get in the habit of releasing our things to the Lord, receiving from him, hearing his voice, tuning our ears to the Lord. Pray. Read the word. Why? Because it's true, and it tells you all the true things you need to lean on when things are hard. Start to sow into your life reading the word. Because when you're enduring something, you want to be able to say, I know that this is hard. But I know the truth that God is with me, that he loves me, that I have access to him, and I am never alone. You want to build those, that up in your heart, and that comes from foundation of relationship with the Lord. Sow into the season that you're in by building yourselves up. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Come up. Any ministry team member will pray with you any Sunday about that. Because a lot of times... That prayer is, I don't know what to pray. You know what? I can pray in the Spirit. I can build myself up by praying in tongues. In my relationship with the Lord, I can pray when I don't know what else it is, how else to pray. I can build myself up that way. The last thing that Paul talked to Timothy about was gentleness. Pursue gentleness. And this is one of the other things that you're like, of all the virtues Paul could have picked, he finished off with gentleness. I don't know about you, but when was the last sermon that you heard about gentleness? We get going with the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. And we get all in the Peter's out. Then we get self-control. Like, but we like miss the middle bits there. Gentleness. Sometimes we just kind of add it on as an afterthought. But I want to tell you something fun about the def definition of gentleness. You want to hear it? Paul uses this. It means a mild, soothing quality, a quality expected in friends, benevolent rulers, tame animals, and mild medications. It's like the feeling you feel when you have a bad allergy day and you take a Benadryl. And then you're just like, yeah, sure. I'm just going to go take a nap. Right? This is gentleness. Now, I am not saying, like, oh, that 
gentleness is like just about you feeling good inside because gentleness is by its nature expressed to other people. It's not gentleness unless it's expressed to someone else. Because we have like, you know, you can be rough or you can be gentle. So it's, it's always towards someone else. And Paul gives two different groups of people that we can be gentle towards. The first one is our brother and sisters in Christ. Galatians 6, 1. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Soothing and gentle. Hey, listen. You're struggling. I want to help you. How about this one? 2 Timothy 2.25. It's soothing and gentle to those who don't know Christ. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Note that this does not say, just act like Jesus and by osmosis all these people will get to know him. It says, gently instruct. We have to have a gentle voice, but a truthful voice. And that can only come through the Holy Spirit. So bottom line, all of these things that Paul gives can't be accomplished on our own. They require from us the work of pursuing a relationship with the Holy Spirit that is richer than what we're living now. There is more for us in our relationship with the Lord. And God is calling us to pursue it. He's calling us to pursue it. So this morning, I don't know about you, but I am challenged by all of these things. I am not standing up on the stage saying, I have accomplished all of these things. I'm saying this is what God is challenging me and I believe that he's challenging all of us with this. This is the next season, and it's a season of pursuit. So I just want to take a couple minutes and make a fresh or new commitment to pursue the Lord together. So if, there is some, if, if this is something that you're like, yes, this is what I want for the next season, I would invite you to just stand with me, and let's commit together to pursue the Lord with intentionality. Lord, we thank you that you call us into new seasons. Lord, we thank you that you don't leave us forever in the mud of spring, but that you bring the flowers. Lord, we thank you for the, the changing of seasons and the beauty that we get to see firsthand living in this place of the changing of seasons, the beauty that you allow us to see. Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you that you don't leave us in the season where we are. Lord, we are so thankful, we are so grateful for the season that we have been in as a church. Lord, that you have been blessing us. Lord, you've been adding to us. Lord, you've been calling us. And Lord, we recognize you calling us deeper. Lord, we recognize you calling us to pursue. Lord, like in, in Song of Solomon chapter 2, where the, where the husband calls to the wife, come away with me, come away with me. Lord, you're calling that for us today. And Lord, we say we recognize it. We're choosing to recognize the season that you are bringing us into. Lord, we're choosing to stop and change the season. Lord, we're stop and prepare ourselves for the season. And Lord, we ask you specifically in our lives that you would show us how to pursue you in each one of these areas. Lord, what does that season of pursuit look like individually in each one of us? Lord, is it getting up 10 minutes early? Is it shutting off the TV 10 minutes earlier? Lord, is it turning on just Christian worship music while we're driving? Or shutting everything off and taking a 25-minute drive just to pray and be with you? Lord, would you specifically speak to us about pursuit in our own lives, Lord? Each one of us, God, we, are, we want you Lord, we want to grow in you. We don't want to stay the same. We want to be more like you. We want to love you more. Lord, we want to receive your love more. God, we want to be gentle. Lord, we want to be righteous, that our, our world would be conformed to your norm, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would begin to burn in each of our hearts pursuit, pursuit of you, Lord. God, call us. 
Lord, speak loudly to our ear to remind us that you're calling us in this season of pursuit. Lord, we welcome you to speak to us. Lord, I pray that you would take us deep in your word as we open it up, as we spend time reading your word. God, would you illuminate it to us? God, would you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to us through your word, that you would change us by your word, God. Lord, that you would build in us a foundation of endurance. God, you'd build in us a foundation that no matter what wind or waves come, we endure. We know you're faithful. We know you're true. We know you love us. We know we're not alone. We know that you're good. That you're holy. Lord, we, we offer our lives to you again. God, we're yours. We're your people. We're your people. Lord, help us to pursue you, God. Help us to pursue you. We say yes to you, God. We're signing up for pursuit. So, Lord, train us. Train us, Lord, to pursue you. Lord, if there are areas of our lives that are not living up to your norm, if there's areas of our lives, Lord, that are not uh, gentle or loving, areas of our lives where um, we just aren't, aren't doing it, Lord, where there's waffling, where there should be endurance, or where there should be faith, there's doubt. Lord, we pray that you would come, that you would build strength in us. God, we give you those things. And would you line them up over this season? Would you show us one by one so that we can repent, so that we can receive forgiveness, receive your strength and your wholeness? Lord, do it in us that we could pursue you wholly, wholly, the W, holy, fully and completely. Come, Holy Spirit, wash fresh over us. Lord, we receive from you the gifts that you want to give. Lord, we receive from you what you want to do to work the ground to grow the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, Lord. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come and fill us and refresh us. Lord, would you meet us every morning like a wave. Lord, when we open our eyes, would you come like a wave. Like a wave, Lord. Speak to us. God, Whatever is in our minds and in our hearts that keeps us from having our eyes on you, show us so we can put it aside and put our eyes on you. Lord, we want to run with you. We want to pursue you, God. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to do what you want to do in our lives, what you want to do in our church, God. Come, awaken pursuit in us. Wake us up for pursuit. We've had a really wonderful time passively receiving from you, but God, would you put in our hearts a hunger for pursuit, God? Come and do what you want to do in us, Lord. In Jesus' name. If you have never received the gift of forgiveness that comes from Jesus, through his death on the cross and his resurrection and become a Christian and you would like to do that today our ministry teams are going to be here in the front if there's an area in your life that you know like you know this is this is the wall that's keeping me from pursuit come the ministry team would love to pray with you help you eat through that wall so we can get to the other side But this week, just take some time with the Lord. Lord, stir up pursuit in my heart. Do something new that you haven't done. Maybe it's been a long time since you spent time just praying in the Spirit. Go for it. Maybe it's been a long time since you sat and read an entire book of the Bible through beginning to end. There's lots of really short ones if you don't have a lot of time. There's lots of long ones if you do. 
But God wants to speak to you. Do something new. Do something new to awaken pursuit in your heart this week. And just cry out to the Lord, Lord, wake it up. Wake me up. Wake me up. So ministry teams, if you would come and be available, that would be great. Doug, if you want to come and bless you and close us out, that would be great too. Wasn't that a great word, everybody? Thanks, Mel. She, uh, she made a prophetic declaration at the beginning for our new season. She said, God is calling us from a season of passive growth to a season of intentionally pursuing him. And I love, I loved that mental picture of that cute little fluffy white puppy eating through drywall because of what he was, he was doggedly pursuing. What wall is standing in your way? Melanie said it. I'm not going to prolong it, but what wall is standing in your way? Eat through that wall. Get through that wall in your pursuit of him. And you're in this with us. We're in this together, right? Like, what a great season for us to be a church, to be a family, and to pursue God together. So let's go. Let's do it. Let's see what he wants to do. Thank you, Jesus. And, and uh, two more things. Enjoy your Labor Day holiday tomorrow. I just pray you have a blessed day in the 90s, not getting sunburned in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray your favor and your blessing on all of our kids who are going back to school this week. Lord, we thank you for your grace, for the right teachers, for the right classmates, for all the right school supplies, Lord God, for the right attitude, the right pursuit of you in their hearts, Lord, as they go back to their schools. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you out in the lobby, and we'll see you next week. God bless.